Introduction by Frederick Locker Lamson, read for LibriVox.org. Introduction. The father of Frederick Locker Lamson, or Frederick Locker, according to the name by which he is generally known, was Edward Hawk Locker, at one time commissioner of Greenwich Hospital. He is described in the Dictionary of National Biography as a man of varied talents and accomplishments, fellow of the Royal Society, an excellent artist in watercolor, a charming conversationalist, an esteemed friend of Southey and Scott. Frederick, the author of London Lyrics, was born, Mr. Augustine Birrell, his son-in-law, writes in Scribner's Magazine, January 1896, in Greenwich Hospital in 1821. After divers adventures in various not over well selected schools, and a brief experience of the city of Somerset House, he became a clerk in the Admiralty, serving under Lord Haddington, Sir James Graham, and Sir Charles Wood. He was twice married, first to Lady Charlotte Bruce, a daughter of Lord Elgin, of the Marbles, and secondly to the only daughter of Sir Curtis Lampson, Baronet of Rolfund in Sussex. The present volume is Locker's earliest literary venture, produced, however, at the comparatively mature age of thirty-six. In 1857, he says, in my confidences, I published a thin volume, certain sparrow flights of song, called London Lyrics. Subsequently, about 1860, Thackeray, who was then editor of the Cornhill magazine, invited Locker to contribute, and poems published there and elsewhere were collected and reprinted from time to time, the original title being always retained. Ten editions, besides some selections privately printed, appeared before the poet's death. In almost all something new was added, in all something old was taken away so that only eight of the twenty-five pieces composing the early thin volume survive in the issue of 1893. These are much altered. It is hoped that readers of Locker's later and more highly finished work will consider a republication of his Primitiae, justified by the interest which attaches to all beginnings. So many people even now confuse minor poetry with bad poetry that it is almost invidious to call a poet minor. Yet there is no doubt that minor poetry can be good in its own way, just as major poetry can be good in its way. If he, Locker, was a minor poet, he was at least, why at least, a master of the instrument he touched, which cannot, writes Mr. Colson Kernahan in the 19th century, for October 1895, be said of all who would be accounted major. Locker was not one of those, in his own opinion, who would be accounted major. My aim, he says, was humble. I used the ordinary meters and rhymes, the simplest language and ideas, I hope flavored with an individuality. I strove not to be flat, and above all, not to be tedious. It is not necessary to prove by argument and illustration that Locker is a minor poet, nor that he belongs to that honorable company of writers of what we now call light verse, the masters of which are, after all, among the immortals, Horace and Herrick. His place in that company is not so easy to define. Probably he stands halfway between the serious singers, who succeed by virtue of grace and artistic finish, yet lack the touch of passion the indefinable something that makes greatness, and the bards whose primary object, like Calverley's, is to make the reader laugh. He elected, says Mr. Coulson Carnahan, to don the cap and bells when he might have worn the singing robes of the poet. A description of one who chose to be a jester when he might have been serious, and hardly applicable to Locker, who is never a professed funny man. Mr. Carnahan is far more just when he claims for London lyrics a kind of sober gentleness which moves neither to laugh nor to weep. His sad scenes may touch us to tender melancholy, but never to tears. His gay ones to smile, but seldom to laughter. Locker's muse is not the muse of high spirits. He does not start with the intention of jesting. He is the gentle and serious spectator of things which are not the most serious in life, with a sense of the humorous which is not repressible, and which enters into all his reflections, but which he never allows to wholly master him. It is really impossible to classify poets on any satisfactory principle. 
every good poet is a class by himself but if the attempt must be made one must say that the author of london lyrics belongs to that school of which the other chief representatives in english or american literature have been prayed oliver winter holmes and mr austin dobson it has always been the fashion to class him with the first named of the trio as a writer of occasional verse or vers de societe these titles like other parts of the nomenclature of the poetic art are not satisfying why smoothly written verse where a boudoir decorum is or ought to always be preserved where sentiment never surges into passion where humor never overflows into boisterous merriment should be conventionally called society verse or occasional verse is not very clear to write society verse is to be the laureate of the cultured leisured pleasure-loving upper classes but some poets satisfy above the requirements locker himself included yet certainly do not write exclusively of or for society then again what is occasional many serious poems are inspired by the transient occasion but we are not presumably to class avenge o lord thy slaughtered saints among occasional pieces nor is wordsworth's sonnet on london at dawn to be called occasional yet the source of it the fact that the poet happened to be upon westminster bridge in the early morning was transient not apparently inherent in the nature of things however these names must be accepted as we find them here is locker's own law occasional verse he says should be short graceful refined and fanciful not seldom distinguished by chastened sentiment and often playful the tone should not be pitched high it should be terse and idiomatic and rather in the conversational key the rhythm should be crisp and sparkling and the rhyme frequent and never forced while the entire poem should be marked by tasteful moderation high finish and completeness however trivial the subject matter may be indeed rather in proportion to its triviality subordination to the rules of composition and perfection of execution are of the utmost importance among the enviable versifiers who can satisfy these requirements prade and locker both hold a high place prade indeed is chief among the writers of vers de societe for not only does his manner conform to the laws laid down by high authorities but his theme is generally society with a capital s prade says locker in my confidences is the very best of his school indeed he has a unique position for in his narrower vein of whimsical wit vernacular banter and antithetical rhetoric which may correctly be called vers de societe in its most perfected form and in its exactest sense he has never been equalled these phrases hit off prade very well if one does not exactly see what society has to do with antithetical rhetoric these two poets so often classed together are not really very much alike both are certainly in lighter vein but they differ apparently in temperament and certainly in method no one would deny to pray the gift of humor but the period in which he wrote was one which admired primarily wit and while it would be too much to say that his heart is not in his theme that he stands detached from it still his sympathies are indubitably subordinate to the effort the successful effort to bring off a neat point to make a pun in the right place to be striking antithetical epigrammatic his verses have the finish in their way of pope's couplet and ovid's pentameter his best-known and most praised work appeals primarily to the taste and the ear always perhaps to the head rather than to the heart there is something of hard brilliance in prade he writes for effect he is epideictic of course this is one object of writers of society verses sole secret to jingle and scan as an unduly severe critic says somewhere one need hardly say that this is not prade's sole secret but technique is certainly his strong point where are my friends i am alone no playmate shares my beaker some lie beneath the churchyard stone and some before the speaker and some compose a tragedy and some compose a rondo and some draw sword for liberty and some draw pleas for john doe tom mill was used to blacken eyes without the fear of sessions 
Charles Medler loathed false quantities as much as false professions. Now Mill keeps order in the land as magistrate pedantic, and Medlar's feet repose unscanned beneath the wide Atlantic. This is the art which does not conceal itself. One may not be able to do the trick, but it is possible to see how the trick is done. No one, says Locker, when speaking of occasional or society verse, has fully succeeded who does not possess a certain gift of irony. That is profoundly true. A would-be writer of light verse who has not the ironical habit of mind had better change his purpose and write an epic. Locker has his full share of the necessary gift. Half gay, half melancholy, always ironical. Dissembling most of pain in some of pleasure. He is in certain ways the appropriate spokesman of a society like our own, which is really most natural when most dissembling, or dismissing with a smile, its deeper emotions. There is nothing about Locker which is not natural. As he is, so apparently does he speak far more candidly and with more self-revelation than Braid, more candidly than Mr. Austin Dobson, who is apt to veil his personality behind a mask of elegant antiquarianism. But Locker is more artless and naive, which qualities are in him not the least inconsistent with irony, than any modern writer, except perhaps R. L. Stevenson now and then, and when the latter naivete itself is sometimes an artifice. Mr. Brander Matthews rightly lays stress on this aspect of Locker's poetry. Individuality and directness of expression. That is the true note of London lyrics. He is far more genuine and spontaneous than Praed. It is difficult and perhaps invidious to compare the two humorists. It may be that Locker's vein of humor is larger and truer than the earlier poets. Praed belongs, as has been said, to a period of other men and other manners. Probably he is the wittier of the two, yet this might be contradicted. Locker's humor has the reflective vein, with a suggestion of pathos, of the great writers who flourished in the early and middle Victorian era. We are perhaps a little out of tune now with the sentiment of the middle of the nineteenth century, and perhaps too with Praed's antithetical rhetoric but locker's humor can never be quite out of fashion readers will always smile not laugh at the housemaid or the pilgrims of pell mell or the lines to my grandmother with her bridal wreath bouquet lace farthingale and gay falbala if romney's touch be true what a lucky dog were you grandpa what fancy slips from atween these cherry lips whisper me fair sorceress in paint what canon says i mayn't marry thee but perhaps for a nutshell's content of whimsical lockerian humour the gem which will occur to most is the delightful reminiscence of infancy i recollect a nurse called anne who carried me about in the grass and one fine day a fine young man came up and kissed the pretty lass she did not make the least objection thinks i aha when i can talk I'll tell Mama, and that's my earliest recollection. Locker's mottoes, of which this is one, often contain his most characteristic lines. Praed could no more have written that, or the lines to my grandmother, than Locker could have written the vicar. Both poets have other strings. Praed's more serious vein could win a contemporary reputation, but he would not have been remembered for this alone after eighty years. In At Her Window, which Mr. Colson Kernahan rightly calls one of the most beautiful love songs of the century, Locker is no longer ironical, but rises to the heights of real passion. Beating heart, we come again where my love reposes. This is Mabel's window pane, these are Mabel's roses. Mabel will be decked anon, zoned in bride's apparel, happy zone, O oh, hark to yon passion shaken carol. Sing thy song, thou tranced thrush, pipe thy best, thy clearest, hush her lattice moves, O oh, hush, dearest Mabel, dearest. I once tried, says Locker, in my confidences, to write like prayed. The effort was not wholly successful. Locker is weakest where his manner is most Pradian, and the poet, either realizing this or molded by the temper of his time, appears to have altered most of the obviously imitative passages. 
thus in tempora mutantur the last stanza runs in eighteen fifty seven what brought this wanderer here and why was pamela away it might be she had found her grave or he had found her gay but the antithetical pun is excised in the eighteen ninety three edition where the lines are the pilgrim sees an empty chair where pamela once sat it may be she had found her grave it might be worse than that so in bramble rise my bank of early violets is now a bank of savings you mark the paramonasia play pawn words does not continue to please the taste of the pun despising fin de siècle public or of locker himself the corresponding stanza in the poem as published in eighteen ninety three is purified of such tricks these alterations are characteristics of locker's literary method he was keenly critical of himself never says mr birrell could mistake good verses for bad and was therefore always changing and polishing his work adding here pruning there thus only eight poems from the eighteen fifty seven volume form part of the london lyrics of eighteen ninety three and only five of these bramble rise piccadilly the pilgrims of pall mall circumstance the widow's mite have maintained their footing throughout all in intervening editions three others are as it were rusticated from the very severely edited selection of eighteen eighty one the variety of forms under which his verses appear at different periods will probably make the poet's works a happy hunting ground for the future commentator who will no doubt assign this lay as he will probably call it to locker that to lampson that again to the lacredae or the lampshunschule the method is familiar no one probably was ever so careful of the limier labor he took we are told great pains with his verses always aiming at a more perfect finish with no loss of that naturalist which as has been said characterizes all his work according to the saying quoted by matthew arnold of jobert he s'inquiétait de perfection perfection to him implied an appearance of spontaneity what looked labored or artificial must be elaborated till it looked spontaneous as it was in thought if not altogether development his critical sense seems to have grown keener with his interest in the making of verses he was a great student of verse mr burrell says and a student especially of that kind of verse of which he was himself one of the masters in eighteen sixty seven he published the well-known collection lira elegantarium assisted by mr kernahan the preface written by locker contains some excellent rules for light verse from which the selections are made this anthology ranges over the whole field of english poetry and like everything else of locker's it shows the man its charm writes the editor's collaborator is entirely of the editor's individuality at least from his favorites in literature one might make a very fair guess at some part of his character so too patchwork a kind of scrapbook a collection of miscellaneous antidotes mostly humorous but not as a rule broadly or farcically funny illustrates his delicate and subtle perception of the laughable locker married lady charlotte bruce in eighteen fifty and soon after left the service of government thenceforward he appears to have led a very placid life happy in his family seeing much of his large circle of friends devoted to poetry and book collecting lira elegantarum was published in eighteen sixty seven patchwork in eighteen seventy nine in eighteen eighty six locker published a catalogue of what he called the rofant library his collection of rare and valuable books mostly the poetry of the fifteenth and sixteenth centuries and autographs of which mr andrew lang has sung the rofant books how fair they show the quarto quaint the aldine tall print autograph portfolio back from the outer air they call the athletes from the tennis ball this rhymer from his rod and hooks would i could sing them one and all the rofant books locker's first wife died in eighteen seventy two in eighteen seventy four he married miss lampson adding her family name to his own the rest of his life was spent for the most part at rofant he died there thirtieth may eighteen ninety five his autobiography my confidences was published posthumously in eighteen ninety six End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
quote, I would build a cloudy house for my thoughts to live in, when for earth too fancy loose and too low for heaven. Hush, I talk my dream alone, I build it bright to see. I build it on the moonlit cloud to which I look with thee. End quote. Mrs. Elizabeth Barrett Browning You shake your curls and ask me why I don't build castles in the sky. You smile and you are thinking too, he's nothing else on earth to do. It needs my dear romantic wear to raise such fabrics in the air, ethereal bricks and rainbow beams, the gossamer of fancy's dreams, and much the architect may lack who labors in the zodiac to rear what I, from chime to chime, attempted once upon a time. My castle was a glad retreat, adorned with bloom and scented briars, a Cupid's model country seat, with all that such a seat requires. A rustic thatch, a purple mountain, a sweet mysterious haunted fountain, a terraced lawn, a summer lake, by sun or moonbeam ever burnished. And then my cot, by some mistake, unlike most cots, was neatly furnished. A trellised porch, a mirrored hall, a hebe laughing from the wall, frail vases from remote Cathay, while under arms and armor wreathed, in trophied guise the marble breathed, a peering fawn, a startled fay, and cabinets with gems inlaid, the legacy of parted years, full curtains of festooned brocade, and Venice lent her chandeliers. Quaint carvings, dark and pillowed light, meet couches for the Sybarite, embroidered carpets, soft as down, the last new novel fresh from town, on silken cushion rich with braid, a shaggy pet from sky was laid, and drowsy-eyed would dozing swing a parrot in his golden ring. All these I saw one happy day, and more than now I care to name. Here, lately shut, that workbox lay, there stood your own embroidery frame, and over this piano bent a form from some pure region sent. Her dusky tresses lustrous shone in massy clusters like your own, and as her fingers pressed the keys, how strangely they resembled these. Yes, you, you only, lady fair, adorned my castle in the air, and life without the least foundation became a charming occupation. We viewed with much serene disdain the smoke and scandal of cocaine, its dupes and dancers, knaves and nuns, possessed by blues or bored by duns. With souls released from earthly tether, we gazed upon the moon together. Our sympathy from night to noon rose crescent with that crescent moon. We lived and loved in cloudless climes, and died in rhymes a thousand times. Yes, you, you only lady fair, adorned my castle in the air. Now tell me, could you dwell content in such a baseless tenement? Or could so delicate a flower exist in such a breezy bower? Because if you would settle in it, twere built for love in half a minute. What's love, you ask? Why, love at best is only a delightful jest. As sad for one, as bad for three, 
so i suggest you jest with me you shake your head and wonder why a denizen of dear me fair should ever condescend to try and build her castle in the air i've music books and all you say to make the gravest lady gay i'm told my essays show research my sketches have endowed a church i've partners who have witty parts i've lovers who have broken hearts quite undisturbed by nerves or blues my doctor gives me all the news poor polly would not care to fly and wasp you know was born in sky to realize your tete-a-tete -tete might jeopardize a giddy pate and quell ennui if pride apart i lost my head or you your heart i'm more than sorry i'm afraid my castle is already made and is that all we gain by fancies for noonday dreams and waking trances such dreams as brought poor souls mishap when baby time was fond of pap and still will cheat with feigning joys while women smile and men are boys the blooming rose conceals an asp and bliss coquetting flies the grasp and waking up snap goes the slight poor cord that held my foolish kite your slave you may not care to know it your humble slave will be your poet farewell can aught for her be willed whose every wish is all fulfilled farewell could wishing weave a spell there's promise in those words farewell i wish your wish may not be marred now wish yourself a better bard end of poem this recording is in the public domain i here is your cradle why surely my jenny such slender dimensions go somewhat to show you were an exceedingly small piccaninny some nineteen or twenty short summers ago your baby days flowed in a much troubled channel i see you as then in your impotent strife a tight little bundle of wailing and flannel perplexed with that newly found fardel called life to hint at an infantine frailties a scandal all bygones are bygones and somebody knows it was bliss such a baby to dance and to dandle your cheeks were so velvet so rosy your toes ay here is your cradle and hope a bright spirit with love now is watching beside it i know they guard o'er the nest you yourself did inherit some nineteen or twenty short summers ago it is hope gilds the future love welcomes it smiling thus wags this old world therefore stay not to ask my future bids fair is my future beguiling if masked still it pleases then raise not its mask is life a poor coil some would gladly be doffing he is riding post haste who their wrongs will adjust for at most tis a footstep from cradle to coffin from a spoonful of pap to a mouthful of dust then smile as your future is smiling my jenny i see you except for that infantine woe scarce changed since you were but a small piccaninny your cheek is still velvet pray what is your toe 
Aye, here is your cradle, much, much to my liking. Though nineteen or twenty long winters have sped. But hark, as I'm talking, there's six o'clock striking. It is time Jenny's baby should be in its bed. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. O oh, cruel time, O oh, tyrant time, whose winter all the streams of rhyme in flowing waves of love sublime in bitter passage freezes. I only see the scrambling goat, the lotus on the water float, while an old shepherd with an oat pipes to the autumn breezes. Mr. M. Collins Yes, here once more, a traveller, I find the angel in, where landlord, maids, and serving men receive me with a grin. They surely can't remember me. My hair is gray and scanter. I'm changed, so changed since I was here. O oh, tempora mutanter. The angel's not much altered since that sunny month of June, which brought me here with Pamela to spend our honeymoon. I recollect it down to e'en the shape of this decanter. We've since been both much put about. O oh, tempora mutanter. Ay, there's the clock and looking glass reflecting me again. She vowed her love was very fair. I see I'm very plain. And there's that daub of Prince Labu. Twas Pamela's fond banter to fancy it resembled me. O oh, tempora mutanter. The curtains have been dyed, but there, unbroken, is the same. The very same cracked pane of glass on which I scratched her name. Yes, there's her tiny flourish still. It used to so enchant her, to link two happy names in one. Oh, tempora mutanter! What brought this wanderer here, and why was Pamela away? It may be she had found her grave, or he had found her gay. The fairest fade, the best of men, may meet with a supplanter. How natural, how trite the cry! Oh, tempora mutanter! End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Quote, Often when I have felt a weariness or distaste at home, have I rushed out into her crowded strand and fed my humor till tears have wetted my cheek for unutterable sympathies with the multitudinous moving picture nursed amid her noise her crowds her beloved smoke what have i been doing all my life if i have not lent out my heart with usury to such scenes see lamb gay shops stately palaces bustle and breeze the whirring of wheels and the murmur of trees by night or by day whether noisy or stilly, whatever my mood is, I love Piccadilly. Wet nights, when the gas on the pavement is streaming, and young love is watching, and old love is dreaming, and beauty is whirled off to conquest, where shrilly Cremona makes nimble thy toes, Piccadilly. Bright days when I leisurely pace to and fro, And meet all the people I do or don't know. Here is jolly old Brown and his fair daughter Lily. No wonder some pilgrims affect Piccadilly. See yonder pair, fonder ne'er, rode at a canter. She smiles on her poet contended to saunter. Some envy her spouse and some covet her filly. He envies them both. He's an ass, Piccadilly. Now were I that gay bride with a slave at my feet, I would choose me a house in my favorite street. Yes or no, I would carry my point willy-nilly. If no, pick a quarrel. If yes, Piccadilly. Thus the high frolic by, thus the lowly are seen, as perched on the roof of yon bulky machine, the Kensington Dilly, 
and Tom Smith or Billy smoke doubtful cigars in ill-used Piccadilly. And there's the balcony where ages ago old Q sat and gazed on the damsels below. There are plausible wolves even now seeking silly red riding hoods small in thy woods, Piccadilly. And there is a statesman, the man of the day, a laughing philosopher, gallant and gay. No darling of fortune more manfully trod, full of years, full of fame, and the world at his nod. Can the thought reach his heart and then leave it more chilly? Old P or old Q, I must quit Piccadilly? Life is checkered a patchwork of smiles and of frowns. We valued its ups. Let us muse on its downs. There's a side that is bright. It will then turn the other. One turn, if a good one deserves such another. These downs are delightful. These ups are not hilly. Let us turn one more turn, ere we quit Piccadilly. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. We knew an old clerk. It was once on time. An era to set sober datists despairing. Then let them despair. Darby sat in a chair near a cross that takes name from the village of Charing. Though silent and lean, Darby was not morose. What Harry had left was more silver than sable. His feet had begun to turn up at the toes from constantly being curled under a table. His pay and expenditure, quite in accord, were both on the strictest economy founded. His rulers in conclave were known as the board. His rulers were sticks of mahogany rounded. In his heart... He looked down on this dignified knot. For why, the forefather of one of these senators, a rascal concerned in the gunpowder plot, had been barber surgeon to Darby's progenitors. Poor fool, to resent the caprices of luck. Still, a long thirty years, it was rather degrading. He'd been writing dispatches which means he had stuck some heads and some tails to much rudimentating. This sounds rather weary and dreary, but no. Though strictly inglorious, his days were quiescent, and his red tape was tied in a true lover's bow each night when returning to Rosemary Crescent. There Joan meets him smiling. The young ones are there, his coming is bliss to the half-dozen wee things. Of his advent the dog and the cat are aware, and Phyllis, neat-handed, is laying the tea-things. This greeting the silent old clerk understands. Now his friends he can love, had he foes he could mock them. So met, so surrounded, his bosom expands. Some tongues have more need of such scenes to unlock them. And Darby, at least, is resigned to his lot. And Joan, rather proud of the sphere he's adorning, has well-nigh forgotten that gunpowder plot. And he won't recall it till ten the next morning. A time must arrive when, in pitiful case, he will drop from his branch like a fruit more than mellow. Is he still to be found in his usual place? Or is he already forgotten, poor fellow? If still at his duty, he soon will arrive. He, he passes this turning because it is shorter. If not within sight as the clock striking five, we shall see him before it is chiming the quarter. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The healthy, wealthy, wise affirm that early birds secure the worm, and doubtless so they do. 
Who scorns his couch should earn by rights A world of pleasant sounds and sights That vanish with the dew. Bright phosphor from his watch released, Now fading from the purple east, The morning waxing stronger, The comely cock that vainly strives To crow from sleep his drowsy wives, Who would be dozing longer. You exorious Chanticleer, and hark, upraise thine eyes, and find the lark, that matutine musician, who heavenward soars on rapture's wings, though sought unseen, who mounts and sings in musical derision. A daughter hastening to prepare her father's humble morning fare, the sturdy reaper's meal. In russet gown and apron blue, the daughter sings, like Lucy, too, she plies her spinning wheel. Anon the early reaper hies to waving fields that clasp the skies, broad sheets of sunlit water. All these were heard or seen by one who stole a march upon that son, and then upon that daughter. This dainty maid, the hamlet's pride, a lambkin trotting at her side, then hide her through the park. A fond and gentle foster dam, maybe she slumbered with her lamb, thus rising with the lark. The lambkin frisked, the damsel fain would wile him back, she called in vain, the truant gambled farther. One followed for the maiden's sake, a pilgrim in an angel's wake, a happy pilgrim, rather. The maid gave chase, the lambkin ran, as only woolly vagrant can who never felt a crook, but stayed at length, as twere disposed, to drink where tawny sands disclosed the margin of a brook. His mistress, who had followed fast, cried, Little rogue, you're caught at last. I'm fleeter, sir, than you. Then straight the wanderer conveyed, where tangled shrubs and branching shade protected her from view. Of all save one. She glanced around, all fearful lest the slightest sound might mortal footfall be. Then shrinkingly she stepped aside one moment, and her garter tied the truant to a tree. Perhaps the world may wish to know the hue of this delightful bow, and how it might be placed. No, not from him, he only knows. It might be purple, blue, or rose. T'was tied with maiden taste. Suffice it that the nymph was fair, with dove-like eyes, and golden hair, and feet of lily dye. And though these feet were pure from stain, she turned her to the brook again, and laved them dreamingly. A while she sat in maiden mood, and watched the shadows in the flood, which varied with the stream. And as each pretty foot she dips, the ripples ope their crystal lips in welcome, as t'would seem. But reveries are fleeting things, which come and go on fancy's wings, now longer and now shorter. The fair one well her day-dream nursed, but when the light-blown bubble burst, she wearied of the water betook her to the spot where yet safe tethered laid her snowy pet to roving tastes a martyr but something met the damsel's gaze which made her cry in sheer amaze good gracious where's my garter yes where indeed the echoes there inquisitive responded where and mourned the missing fetter a something else a little space must render duty in its place till banished for a better the blushing fair her lamb led home, perhaps resolved no more to roam at peep of day together. If chance so takes them, it is plain, she will not venture forth again without an extra tether. A fair white stone will mark this morn. He wears a prize, one lightly worn, loves gauge, though not intended. Of course he'll guard it near his heart, till suns and even stars depart, and chivalry has ended. And knighthood he'll not envy you, The crosses, stars, and cordon bleu, Which pride for folly barters. He'll bear his cross mid mundane jars, His ribbon prize, and thank his stars He does not crave your garters. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. My little friend, so small and neat, whom years ago I used to meet in Pall Mall daily. How cheerily you tripped away to work, it might have been to play, you tripped so gaily. 
and time trips too this moral means you then were midway in the teens that i was crowning we never spoke but when i smiled at morn or eve i know dear child you were not frowning each morning when we met i think some sentiment did us to link nor joy nor sorrow and then at eve experience taught our hearts fell back upon the thought we meet to-morrow and you were poor and how and why how kind to come it was for my especial grace meant had you a parlor next the stars a bird some treasured plants in jars about your casement you must have dwelt of sanctium like little darling what's her name eugene sue's glory perchance unwittingly i've heard your thrilling toned canary bird from that fifth story i've seen some changes since we met a patient little seamstress yet with small means striving have you a lilliputian spouse and do you dwell in some doll's house is baby thriving can bloom like thine my heart grows chill have sought that born unwelcome still to bosom smarting the most forlorn what worms we are would wish to finish this cigar before departing i sometimes to pall mall repair and see the damsels passing there but though i try to obtain one glance they look discreet as though they'd someone else to meet as have not i too yet still i often muse upon our many meetings come and gone july december now let us make a tryst and when dear little soul we meet again in some serener sphere why then thy friend remember End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The pitcher may go often to the well, but it gets broken at last. Away, yes, simple ones, away. Bring no vain fancies hither. The brightest dreams of youth decay. The fairest roses wither. I, since this fountain first was planned and dryad learnt to drink, have lovers held neat hand in hand, sweet parley at its brink. From youth to age, this waterfall most tunefully flows on. But where, I tell me, where are all those constant lovers gone? the falcon on the turtle prays and fondest vows are either the brightest dream of youth decays the fairest roses wither thy russet pitcher set adown fair maid and list to one whom much this sorry world hath known a muser thereupon though youth is ardent gay and bold youth flatters and beguiles though giles is young and i am old ne'er trust thy heart to giles thy pitcher may some luckless day be broken coming hither thy doting slave may prove a knave the fairest roses wither she laughed outright she scorned him quite she filled her russet pitcher for that dear sight an anchorite might deem himself the richer ill-fated maiden go thy ways thy lover's vows are lither the brightest dream of youth decays the fairest roses wither these days are soon the days of yore six summers pass and then that musing man would see once more the fountain in the glen again to stray where once he strayed those woods with verdure richer half hoping to espy the maid come tripping with her pitcher no light step comes but evil starred he finds a mournful token there lies a russet pitcher marred 
the damsel's pitcher broken profoundly moved that muser cried the spoiler hath been hither oh would the maiden first had died the fairest rose must wither the tender floweret blooms apace but chilling winds blow o'er it fades unheeded and its place shall never know it more he turned from that accursed ground his world-worn bosom throbbing a bow-shot thence a child he found the little man was sobbing he gently stroked that curly head my child what brings thee hither weep not my simple child he said or let us weep together thy world i ween my child is green as garden undefiled thy thoughts should run on mirth and fun where dost thou dwell my child twas then the tiny urchin spoke my daddy's giles the ditcher i water fetch and oh i've broke my mammy's russet pitcher End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Oh, where dost thou trip it? The patriarch said. A rose in thy bosom so daintily laid. A pilgrim whose shadow extends to the tomb would gaze on its beauty, would breathe its perfume. Oh, raise not thy hand cried the maid nor suppose i ever can part with this beautiful rose the bloom is a gift of the fays who declare it will shield me from sorrow as long as i wear it and sigh not old men such a doleful high ho dost think i possess not the will to say no and shake not thy head i could pitiless be should supplicants come even younger than thee the damsel passed on with a confident smile the old man extended his walk for a while his musings were trite and their burthen forsooth the wisdom of age and the folly of youth noon comes and noon goes paler twilight is there rosy day dons the garb of a penitent fair the patriarch strolls in the path of the maid where cornfields are ripe and awaiting the blade and echo was mute to the patriarch's tread how tranquil is nature that patriarch said he onward advances where bows overshade a lonelier spot and the barley is laid he gazes around not a creature is there no sound upon earth and no voice in the air but fading there lies a poor bloom that he knows neglected unheeded a beautiful rose end of poem this recording is in the public domain it ripened by the river banks where musk and moonlight aiding dons whiskerandos play sad pranks dark donna's serenading by moorish maiden it was plucked who broke some hearts they say then by saxon sweetheart it was sucked who threw the peel away then how little thought the london fair or dark-eyed girl of seville that i should reel upon that peel and find my proper level end of poem this recording is in the public domain to the south of the church and beneath yonder yew a pair of child lovers i've seen more than once were they there in the years of the two when added might number thirteen they sat on the grave which had never a stone the name of the dead to determine 
it was life paying death a brief visit alone a notable text for a sermon they tenderly prattled what was it they said the turf on that hillock was new o oh, ken ye poor little ones aught of the dead or could he be heedful of you i wish to believe and believe it i must that a father beneath them was laid i wish to believe i will take it on trust that father knew all that they said my own you are five very nearly the age of that poor little fatherless child and some day a true love your heart will engage when on earth i my last may have smiled then visit my grave like a good little lass where'er it may happen to be and if any daisies should peer through the grass be sure they are kisses from me and place not a stone to distinguish my name for strangers and gossips to see but come with your lover as these lovers came and talk to him gaily of me and while you are smiling your father will smile such a sweet little daughter to have but mind oh yes mind you are merry the while i wish you to visit my grave end of poem this recording is in the public domain at worthing an exile from geraldine g how aimless how wretched an exile is he promenades are not even prunella and leather to love us if love us can't put them together he flies the parade sad by ocean he stands he traces a geraldine g on the sands but a g though her loved patronymic is green i will not betray thee my own geraldine the fortunes of men have a time and a tide and fate the old fury will not be denied that name was of course soon wiped out by the sea and she jilted the exile to geraldine g they meet but they never have spoken since that he hopes she is happy he knows she is fat she wooed on the shore now is wed in the strand and i it was i wrote her name on the sand end of poem this recording is in the public domain vanity of vanity saith the preacher all is vanity ecclesiastes vanitas vanitatum has rung in the ears of gentle and simple for thousands of years the wail is still heard yet its notes never scare or simple or gentle from vanity fair this fair has allurements like to engage the dimples of youth and the wrinkles of age though mirth may be feigning though sheen may be glare the gingerbread's gilded in vanity fair old deves there rolls in his chariot of state there jack takes his joan to a lowlier rate st giles st james from alley and square send votaries plenty to vanity fair that goal would be vain where the guerdon was dross so come whence they may they must come by a loss the tree was enticing its branches are bare hey ho for the promise of vanity fair my son the sham goddess i warn thee to shun beware of the beautiful temptress my son her blandishments fly or despising the snare go laugh at the follies of vanity fair that stupid old deves once honest enough his honesty sold for stars ribbons and stuff and joan's pretty face has been clouded with care since jack brought her ribbons at vanity fair contemptible deves too credulous joan yet each has a vanity fair of his own my son you have yours but you need not despair myself i've a weakness for vanity fair philosophy halts wisest counsels are vain we go we repent 
we return there again. Tonight you will certainly meet with us there, exceedingly merry at Vanity Fair. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. What changes greet my wistful eyes in quiet little Bramble Rise, once fairest of its shire? How altered is each pleasant nook! The dumpy church used not to look so dumpy in the spire. This village is no longer mine, and though the inn has changed its sign, the beer may not be stronger. The river dwindled by degrees is now a brook the cottages are cottages no longer the thatch is slate the plaster bricks the trees have cut their ancient sticks or else those sticks are stunted i'm sure these thistles once grew figs these geese were swans and once those pigs more musically grunted where early reapers whistled shrill, a whistle may be noted still, the locomotive's ravings. New custom, newer want begets. My bank of early violets is now a bank of savings. Ah, there's a face I know again. Fair Patty trotting down the lane to fetch a pail of water. Yes, Patty, still. I much suspect tis not the child i recollect but patty patty's daughter and has she too outlived the spells of breezy hills and silent dells where childhood loved to ramble then life was thornless to our ken and bramble rise thy hills were then a rise without a bramble Whence comes the change? Twere easy told how some grow wise and some grow cold, and all feel time and trouble. And mouldy sages much aver that if the past's a gossamer, the future is a bubble. So let it be at any rate. My fate is not the cruel fate, which sometimes I have thought her. My heart leaps up, and I rejoice, as falls upon my ear thy voice, my frisky little daughter. Come hither, puss, and perch on these, your most unworthy father's knees, and try and tell him. Can you? Are Punch and Judy bits of wood? Does Dolly boast of ancient blood, or is it only brand new? We talk sad stuff, and Bramble Rise is lovely to the infant's eyes, whose doll is ever charming. She does not weigh the pros and cons. Her pigs still please, her geese are swans, though more or less alarming. Oh, mayest thou own my winsome elf, some day a pet just like thyself, her sanguine thoughts to borrow content to use her brighter eyes, accept her childish ecstasies, and, need be, share her sorrow. My wife, thou life is called a jaunt, in sadness rife, in sunshine scant, though mundane joys the wisest grant, have no enduring basis. Tis something in this desert drear, for thee so fresh, for me so sere, to find in puss our daughter dear a little cool oasis. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Fragile creations of still frailer man that men outlast though to eternity from whence he came the scribe be past oh there are tongues within these dry brown leaves that speak as autumns do they cry of death and sorrow to me to you mr george thornbury 
old letters wipe away the tear and gaze upon these pale mementos a pilgrim finds his journal here since first he took to walk on ten toes yes here are scrawls from clapham rise do mothers still their schoolboys pamper oh how i hated dr wise oh how i loved a well-filled hamper how strange to commune with the dead dead joys dead loves and wishes thwarted here's cruel proof of friendships fled and sad enough of friends departed and here's the offer that i wrote in thirty three to lucy diver and here's john wiley's begging note he never paid me back a stiver and here my feud with major spike our bet about the french invasion on looking back i acted like a donkey upon that occasion and here a letter from the row how mad i was when first i learnt it they would not take my book and now i'd give a trifle to have burnt it and here a heap of notes at last with love and dove and sever never though hope though passion may be past their perfume is as sweet as ever a human heart should beat for two whatever say your single scorners and all the hearts i ever knew had got a pair of chimney corners see here a double violet two locks of hair a deal of scandal i'll burn what only brings regret go betty fetch a lighted candle end of poem this recording is in the public domain my sprightly neighbour gone before to that unknown and silent shore shall we not meet as heretofore some summer morning when from thy cheerful eyes a ray has struck a bliss upon the day a bliss that would not go away a sweet forewarning susanna still that name can raise the memory of ancient days and hearts unwrung when all too bright our future smiled when she was mirth's adopted child and i was young I see the cot with spreading eaves, Embosomed bright in summer leaves, As heretofore. The gables quaint, the pansy bed, Old Robin trained the roses red About the door. A seat did most blithe Susan please Beneath two shady elder trees Of rustic make. Old Robin's handiwork again, He dearly loved those elders twain, For Susan's sake. Her gleeful tones and laughter gay Lent sunshine to a gloomy day, And trouble fled, Yet when her mirth was passing wild, Though still the faithful Robin smiled, He shook his head. Perchance the old man harboured fears That happiness is wed with tears On this poor earth, Or else may be his fancies were That youth and beauty are a snare If linked with mirth. And times are changed, how changed that scene, For mark old Robin's altered mien And feeble tread, His toil has ceased to be his pride, at Susan's name he turns aside and shakes his head. And summer smiles, but summer spells can never charm where sorrow dwells, nor banish care. No fair young form the passer sees, and still the much-loved elder trees throw shadows there. The well-remembered seat is gone, and where it stood is set a stone, a simple square. The worldling gay or man austere may pass the name recorded here, but we will stay to shed a tear and breathe a prayer. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. But thou that didst appear so fair to fond imagination, dost rival in the light of day her delicate creation. Wordsworth It shall not be Albert nor Arthur, though both are respectable men. His name shall be that of his father, my Benjamin shortened to Ben. Yes, much as I wish for a corner in each of my relatives' wills, I will not be reckoned a fauna. That creaking of boots must be squills. It is clear, though his means may be narrow, this infant his age will adorn. I shall send him to Oxford from Harrow. I wonder how soon he'll be born. A spouse thus was airing his fancies, below, t'was a labour of love, and calmly reflecting on Nancy's more practical labour above. Yet while it so pleased him to ponder, elated at ease and alone, that pale, patient victim up yonder had budding delights of her own. Sweet thoughts in their essence diviner than dreams of ambition and pelf, a cherub, no babe will be finer, invented and nursed by herself. 
one breakfasting, dining and teeing, with appetite naught can appease, and quite a young reasoning being, when called on to yawn and to sneeze. What cares that heart, trusting and tender, for fame or avuncular wills, except for the name and the gender, she is almost as tranquil as squills. That father, in reverie scented, dumbfounded his brain in a whirl, heard squills as the creaking boots entered, announced that his boy was a girl. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. St. Mark's Gospel, Chapter 12 Verses 42, 43, 44. The widow had but only one, a puny and decrepit son. But day and night, though fretful oft, and weak and small, a loving child, he was her all, the widow's might. The widow's might, yes, so sustained she battled onward, nor complained, though friends were fewer, and, cheerful at her daily care, a little crutch upon the stair was music to her. I saw her then, and now I see, though cheerful and resigned, still she has sorrowed much. She has, he gave it tenderly, much faith, and carefully laid by a little crutch. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Dans le bonheur de nos meilleurs amis, nous trouvons souvent quelque chose qui ne nous plaît pas entièrement. She passed up the aisle on the arm of her sire, a delicate lady in bridal attire, fair emblem of virgin simplicity. Half London was there, and my word there were few, who stood by the altar or hidden a pew, but envied Lord Nigel's felicity. O oh, beautiful bride, still so meek in thy splendor, so frank in thy love and its trusting surrender, going hence thou wilt leave us the town dim. May happiness wing to thy bosom unsought, and Nigel, esteeming his bliss as he ought, prove worthy thy worship. Confound him. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Mary in her hand has sixpence. Mary starts to fetch some butter. Mary's pinafore is spotless. Off she goes across the gutter, gleeful, radiant, as she thus did, proud to be so largely trusted. One, two, three, small steps she's taken, blissfully away she's tripping. When good lack, and who'd a thought it, down goes Mary, slipping, slipping. Daubs her clothes, the little slut, her sixpence too rolls in the gutter. Never creep back so despairing, dry those eyes, my little Mary. All of us start off in high glee, many come back quite contrary. I've mourned sixpences in scores too, damaged hopes and pinafores too. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Miss Edith lifts the latch with care, and now she must brave the chill night air. She has violet eyes and ruby lips, a dancing shape and away she skips. She hies to the haunt of a hermit weird, with flaming eyes and a forky beard. A shocking wizard who, gossips say, has dwelt in his cavern a year to-day. O oh, ancient man, I am filled with fear. My lover has left me full a year. I swear to return in a year, said he, or question the man of mystery. Your eyes are blue and your lips are red. I swear my love to come back, he said. O oh, fearsome man, I pray of you, can he prove so false whom I think so true? O oh, daughter fair, I am sad to say that young men now and then betray. Thy lover, I wis, has thy trust betrayed, for he presently woos a witching maid. Her eyes are blue, and I tell thee this, she has tempting lips that he fain would kiss. But courage, my child, thou mayst yet discover a clue to the heart of this worthless lover. 
he muttered, when thus he the maid had cheered, a strange sound that was drowned in the forky beard. Then all around loud thunders broke, and the cave was wrapped in fire and smoke, and that fearsome man has disappeared with his flaming eyes and his forky beard. And Edith weeps in rapture sweet to find her lover at her feet. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. My Kate at the Waterloo Column Tomorrow precisely at eight Remember, thy promise was solemn And thine till tomorrow, my Kate That evening seemed strangely to linger The license and luggage were packed And time, with a long and short finger Approvingly marked me exact Arrived woman's constancy blessing no end of nice people I see, some hither, some thither words pressing, but none of them waiting for me. Time passes, my watch how I con it. I see her, she's coming, no stuff. Instead of Kate's smart little bonnet, it is Aunt and her wonderful muff. Yes, fortune deserves to be chidden. It is a coincidence queer. Whenever one wants to be hidden, one's relatives always appear. Near nine, how the passers despise me. They smile at my anguish, I think. And even the sentinel eyes me, and tips that policeman the wink. Ah, Kate made me promises solemn. At eight she had vowed to be mine, while waiting for one at this column. I find I've been waiting for nine. O oh, fame on thy pillar so steady, Some dupes watch beneath thee in vain. How many have done it already? How many will do it again? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To wayward imps all smiles or tears with large round eyes of ceaseless wonder, small pictures with extensive ears, and thinkers prone to urchin plunder, two whispering lovers, blissful pair, is he the rogue, or hath she tricked him, unless he dupes his mistress there, the chances are he'll fall a victim, to toiling ones of sober age, their bet with care a losing wager. They own, though now so very sage, they might have been a trifle sager. Two frail old wretches, sick and sad, yet sore dismayed lest death should take them. Come, hang it, things, though passing bad, are not so bad as some would make them. For, like yon clock, when twelve shall sound, The call these poor old souls obeying, Together shall their hands be found, And earnest they are humbly praying. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. He met her with her milking cans, too fast the moment speeded, for while they chat on this and that, my thirst may low unheeded. And was she called a forward jade, and was he graceless reckoned, because he stopped the dairy maid, enchanted by my second? Though stars in thousands stud the pole, the field's own stars as yellow. And when I gave that last my whole, she thanked a happy fellow. But she was called a forward jade, and I was graceless reckoned. I only kissed that dairy maid, enraptured by my second. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
Toll, toll the bell, its iron tongue, its weighty as my second. Dig, dig the grave, to life he clung, but now his days are reckoned. Old man, who'll ring a nail for thee, or dress thy couch of clay? Why didst not thou thy death foresee, and dig it for to-day? King Death his journeyman demands, on all he works his worst. His dart he's flung at old and young, Death heedeth not my first. Old man, thou'st dug some scores of graves, Who'll turn the mould for thine? And when this spade thy bed hath made, Who'll lift a spade at mine? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Small imp of blackness, off at once, Expend thy mirth as likes thee best, Thy toil is over for the nonce. Yes, opus operatum est. When dreary authors vex thee sore, Thy mentors old, and would remind thee, That if thy griefs are all before, Thy pleasures are not all behind thee. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. End of London Lyrics by Frederick Locker Lampson